All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the Growing Vegetables in Urban Spaces for Sustenance and Beauty. Today we have Jody Healy with us. Jody currently works independently providing horticultural services. Currently, she instructs courses at the University of Guelph and Mohawk College, delivers seminars at Landscape Ontario, and is working on her master's degree at Vancouver Island University. Jody is a graduate of the Bachelor of Science Plant Biology at the University of Guelph and has spent 10 years working at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Burlington. Here she worked as a gardens manager, cur curator of the annual display and plant records coordinator, allowing her to contribute to many aspects of the horticultural department. She also has experience with interior landscaping, exterior landscaping, and floral design as she has been a judge for the Monarch Awards. She is an avid organic vegetable gardener. Now, before we get started, just a few brief housekeeping notes. If you have any questions, please do add them into the chat box on the side and Jody will be answering them at the end of the session. If your screen freezes, please hit the, the reconnect button at the top of the screen. And at the end of the session, we will be sending out an email to all of the attendees with the link to the replay, as well as some resources that Jody has provided for you. So thank you very much and take it away, Jody. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, Carrie. I appreciate that. Uh, so normally when I do a presentation, I would start with my background, but since Carrie gave such a great introduction there, I think you guys know a little bit about me. So I don't know about all of you, but I have been in the house, mostly in the house for about seven weeks now. And I used to tell people that I liked working with plants because I preferred to spend less time with people and more time with plants. I have changed my mind about that. And now I find that I'm really, really missing people. So I'm happy that there's at least some people hearing my voice today and we can maybe uh, converse a little bit at the end about growing vegetables. Uh, I know, uh, I've had a lot of people, even just family and friends, sending me text messages, asking me questions because they know that I know a little bit about vegetables and it seems to be something that's front of mind for a lot of people right now. I'm not sure what you guys are experiencing in the industry, if you're having an increase in interest in, in this topic, but I'm hoping today that we can kind of go through the basics of what you need to have vegetables in any yard. So what I'm gonna do today is kind of start with uh, landscape design but with a spin on vegetables so how to make when you do plant vegetables you want them to look good especially if we're using them in urban spaces in our front yards uh, highly visible locations so I'll start with how we would go about designing a vegetable garden and then move into how we will actually grow the vegetables so the requirements that you need to get fruit production uh, that type of thing and then we'll go into plant selection, which is the fun part and something that we all usually, well, I know myself get very carried away with when I'm planning a vegetable garden. So that's uh, the overview of today's uh, session. So we'll start talking a little bit about designing. So if you were to design any typical landscape, uh, the first thing you kind of have to decide is what style do you want it to be? So. In most cases, when we're planting a vegetable garden in a, in a landscape, there is an existing style in the yard. Or perhaps you're starting from a clean slate. Oftentimes you're starting with an existing landscape. So you kind of have to decide what style you want your vegetable garden to be. It has to match the existing landscape. So if you have a very formal landscape, uh, you might want to use this style here. So a formal vegetable garden would be very symmetrical uh, geometric shapes. So you might just do rows or you might get fancy and do something like triangles, but straight lines, geometric shapes, and usually a lot of symmetry. So you might plant the same thing on both sides of a path. Um, some boxwood hedge, if you kind of think of it that way. Let me show you a few examples here. So this is an example of a formal style garden. So you're probably used to seeing ornamental gardens that are formal like this with a clipped hedge. Uh, this is Martha Stewart's herb garden at the New York Botanical Garden. So it's not uh, vegetables, but it's all edible herbs. You can see artichokes in the middle. There's some um, golden oregano, a lot of thyme and sage. I'm not sure what the topiary uh, trees are, um, but you can see in this picture that it's a very formal style. So everything is geometric shape, straight lines, um, and a lot of repetition in this design as well. So that's a typical formal style. 
This is another formal planting. This is um, a garden in the UK, and you can see it's it's using the the square gardening uh, model there. So each little spot for a single species is a square foot in size, very formal. This is more of a traditional vegetable garden. So planted in rows um, with a nice frame. So if you have a landscape um, that is already very formal, a lot of straight lines, the pathways are straight, the hardscaping is straight, maybe there's some buildings um, that are very formal looking, this is what you should be trying to, to achieve installing something that you might want to add a lot of edging to or you might want to add some sort of hedge to provide that formal structure. The other uh, style, if you have a more naturalized uh, landscape that you're trying to incorporate a vegetable garden in, you might want to use an informal style. So in this type of style, you're looking for things to flow uh, using curved lines, um, asymmetrical. So when we talk about asymmetry, rather than having things exactly the same on either side, they're just balanced um, in a more general sense. So say you had a tree in the distance in the landscape, you might have something large at the front of the landscape. So it's still balanced, but it's not a strict symmetry on either side. So there's um, symmetry, but it's it's just a little bit disparate. Um, and more naturalistic uh, plantings in an informal style. So you might, uh, informal styles generally have uh, more a mix of plantings rather than just having all vegetables in one spot you might mix your vegetables into existing beds and usually a lot more diversity because you're not needing to have the same plants to, to get that formal structure. So this is an example of a an informal uh, vegetable garden that I saw um, in, at Atlanta Botanical Garden and what they had was basically an amphitheater built out of stone and these kind of uh, angled raised beds were planted above the wall with just um, kind of amorphous uh, blobs of vegetables. So just a very, very uh, naturalistic looking planting, kind of looked like a meadow when you were standing there because they had things like, um, you can see the yellow is uh, flowering mustard uh, and then the mustard greens with a really, really dark um, uh, burgundy foliage. And then there's a lot of kale and cabbage and herbs. Uh, they had espaliered apple trees along the top of the wall there. So it does have formal elements because it does have that formal wall and the espalier kind of gives a formality to it, but the plantings are very naturalistic in style. And this is another example of a more naturalistic garden. So again, there is some formality, the beds have edges, but the shapes are not strictly geometric. It's not strictly symmetrical um, and a lot of um, curved lines uh, in this design. So that's more of an informal style. But often what you see, because none of us uh, have exactly one style going on in our backyards, I know myself I don't, I have lots of different things going on back there, including play areas for kids and and um, uh, an old shed that isn't really very stylistic at all. So oftentimes what we have to deal with is kind of more of a contemporary style where you're doing a combination of both. So uh, a couple examples of that is here you can kind of see it's it's looks at the Chicago Botanical Garden like they had very formal beds in the past um, lined with bricks, geometric shapes. But what they've done is kind of done a, a very modern naturalistic planting within that bed. So they've got long or very um, loose underplanting with cabbage and parsley. And then they've created some uh, tall topiaries with uh, I think it's edible violets in that picture there. So even if what you have to work with um, is a formal style, it doesn't mean that your planting has to be formal. You can kind of mix the, the two styles together and still make something look nice. And we call that style contemporary. And again, another example of that um, at Royal Botanical Gardens in Burlington, they have these very formal beds when you first walk out of the main building, um, that kind of an alleyway that leads to the, the main eating uh, restaurant in the garden and in the past they were planted very formally so you would see uh, annuals down this pathway uh, very formal plantings with um, lots of symmetry lots of color and they changed it up uh, one year to do more of a, a vegetable planting uh, so they have some edible peppers here and some uh, basil and you can see they've kind of used um, more of a modern contemporary plant palette in a in a formal setting Still very formal uh, with the repetition all the way down the alley though. So that's just to give you some uh, inspiration and some idea of what 
kind of styles you can work with because you really have to have a vision before you start um, planting vegetables. So uh, one last slide here. This is just a, kind of a more uh, typical vegetable garden and it can kind of gives you an idea of you can still use, um, you can be, do be very simple in your plant selection and uh, still make it look uh, like a very formal planting. So we'll talk about the principles of landscape design now. And these are the ones that I consider when I'm thinking about how to design a vegetable garden. I know there's a lot of principles of landscape design that a lot of people find uh, refer to and some are more important uh, depending what you're doing. But the ones I can usually consider for vegetable gardening are, what is the function of a space? Uh, does the space have unity throughout? How do you move around the space? We need to think about scale, proportion, focal points and perspectives. So let's uh, take a closer look at some of those. So we'll start with function. So most of us have a small urban space and we do a lot of things in these spaces. We entertain people, uh, we play, we grow food, we eat food. Uh, there are often utilities in the landscape and things like parking and security that need to be considered. So you have to have a good idea of, of what's happening in that space and plan your vegetable garden accordingly. So in this space here that we're looking at, uh, the function of this really seems to me to be focused on entertainment. So if I was to, to have a client that was asking for a vegetable garden in this type of a space, I'd probably make the assumption that they want it to be um, something kind of as an aside to their backyard. They don't want their entire backyard to be a vegetable garden. They don't want it to be a huge full point. It's going to be formal because all of the, the elements of this landscape are straight lines, lots of hardscaping. So it's kind of going to be an accent piece to to this landscape. And obviously it's something you can uh, consult with a client, but that's my first impression looking at a space like this. Whereas if I look at a space like this and was asked to incorporate vegetables in this space, I would think that the intention of this garden is more to enjoy the garden. It's not a place that you would um, spend a long time entertaining or playing. It's really a tranquil space um, for someone to sit and enjoy the landscape. And it's more, it's more about the garden than it is uh, other functions. So I might be more willing to incorporate more vegetables, uh, definitely in a more naturalistic style in a, in a garden like this. And, and I think it would be fair that to say that plants can take up more space uh, in this landscape than they could in the previous. That would be the, the uh, request of the customer. So once you know the function of the space and you've kind of aligned the kind of the size of your vegetable garden and the space that it'll occupy uh, with the function, then you have to think about unity. So you need to make sure that what you're putting in is going to match the space. So that can be done either by, if there's a lot of hardscaping in the space, you could be including or incorporating that into maybe a raised bed, making sure that you're bringing the color uh, pattern throughout the raised bed that matches the hardscaping, maybe it has to match the house, uh, or at least in the same uh, tone of colors. You can do this with plants, so maybe you want to uh, put repetition by adding some really nice kale plants in both the vegetable garden and in the flower garden, so you're just bringing the eye through the entire landscape using uh, vegetables. You can do it with features, things like trellises, um, ornaments, that type of thing can kind of uh, unify the landscape. can also be done with texture. So if you see in this picture here, you see a lot of um, kind of gray, fuzzy plants. So sometimes all you need to do is choose a, a few perennials and a few vegetables that kind of have the same texture and that will be enough to kind of pull the whole landscape together. And obviously color can be done in the same way. So planting something maybe that has burgundy foliage in both the perennial garden and in the vegetable space can kind of bring the, the eye throughout the landscape. And forms and shapes. So a lot of shapes in this picture here, as you can see something like a clipped hedge or some topiary can also help um, unify the landscape. So when you think of repetition, it doesn't have to be all the beds have to be the same. It can be done in lots of different ways, uh, but really does help to, to make the vegetable garden look like part of the, of the yard. So movement is also important. This is obviously not a picture of a vegetable garden, but I like this image just because it kind of gives you an idea of how um, planting 
something in this sort of fashion where it looks like it's moving is a really nice um, aesthetic. It really kind of gives it a different feel. Um, so I, when you're planting a vegetable garden, it's nice to use the aesthetic that you can get out of making something look like it's moving. But the other important element is it has to be functional. So that previous image was definitely not a functional um, use of movement. It was more for a visual appeal because you couldn't walk around that, uh, that uh, structure very easily. And in a vegetable garden, movement is really important because you need to get in there. You need to go in and harvest and water and take care of the plants. So you need to think about how you move around a vegetable garden. Is there space on all sides of it? Um, or how wide is it? Can you reach it from one side? Uh, it's really important consideration when you're designing a vegetable garden. So this is just an example here of some empty beds where there's they're big enough that you can reach from both sides to the center of the bed. You don't have to walk in the bed to do your harvesting or your weeding. So lots of pathways and the bed size is really important for a vegetable garden. So scale and proportion are really more about the big picture. So we talked a little bit about the function of the vegetable garden. And I think scale really has to tie in with how, well, first of all, scale of the entire landscape should be in line with the, the house. The scale of the vegetable garden should be in line with uh, how much time that person has to take care of it. Um, you don't, even if someone has acres and acres and acres, if you put in a giant vegetable garden, you have to be able to take to tend it. So that's a really important consideration for scale. And you also want it to match the landscape. So you don't want, if there's a lot of perennial gardens, um, you might not want to overtake that beauty with um, vegetables. You just want to make sure that it kind of matches the existing beds. You don't want to make, maybe make it twice the size of the existing garden bed. So just keeping it in scale with what else is going on in that yard and uh, making sure it's proportionate to to what the person wants in their yard. Do they want to have uh, more vegetables, more perennials, uh, that type of thing. So you can kind of see in this picture that the, the focus of this garden is obviously vegetables. So the proportion and scale is such that um, their entire yard is used for vegetable gardening. Focal points are hard in when you're gardening with vegetables. Usually when we're, we're talking about typical landscape design, you can use things like trees, large shrubs. Um, it's really easy to, to come up with a plant that is a focal point, something really showy. It's a little bit more challenging with vegetables because we're talking about plants that are mostly in the same height range, uh, a lot of the same color range. Um, I mean, you can add color and height, but you have to be a bit creative. So. When we're talking about focal points with vegetable gardening, you usually have to incorporate either a really nice container, a trellis, uh, something like you see in this picture, just something ornamental that can be used as a focal point in the garden, or perhaps you're incorporating uh, vegetables with, with some other types of plants. But focal points are important there. They kind of draw the eye. Uh, in a vegetable garden, they can be used either as an accent to draw the eye to something really nice, or they can also be used to kind of distract people from something that isn't so nice because not, there's some points of the season when your vegetables aren't going to be looking uh, as you'd like. So you might want to have a focal point to kind of distract people's attention from the part of the vegetable garden that isn't looking great in the heat of the summer, for example. And uh, finally, perspective. Um, so you have to just, whenever you're designing something, it's important to think about where people are going to be seeing it from. So if people are seeing it from ground level, you want to make sure all of your height is at the back of the landscape. If people are going to be standing uh, from like in this picture from a staircase or something like that and seeing the top of it, the shape of your beds is more important because people are going to see it from that perspective. So just thinking about where people are going to be looking at it and planning your focal point and your um, the plantings and the height of them uh, is important. So that's kind of a crash course in, in considerations when designing your vegetable garden. So that's kind of the fun part, the thought process, the part where you consult a lot with your client. Uh, now we're going to get into kind of the more uh, nitty gritty necessities of successfully growing vegetables. So I'm going to just go over five of the principles that are really important um, to have success with vegetables. So you need to get the right site, uh, the right format for planting. 
we have to have good soil. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to ensure that. Uh, companion planting is uh, something that can be really helpful when growing vegetables along with crop rotation. And finally, the biggest thing for uh, vegetable gardens is maintenance. So we'll end this section with that. So site selection. I get a lot of people asking me, can I grow vegetables in shade? Uh, the answer is not very successfully. If you want to grow vegetables in shade, you need to stick to leafy greens and herbs. And the reason for that is they don't need to produce fruit. They don't, they can grow slowly if that's what the, the sun is going to let them do. Uh, you can harvest them small. Uh, herbs, you just harvest clippings. Uh, lettuce can be harvested at any life stage. So if, if you have a lot of shade to deal with and you want to be successful, you really need to stick to that um, plant selection. To get really good fruit production out of a vegetable garden, really good harvest, you need to have six to eight hours of full sun. And there really is no way around that. Um, the more sun, the better for vegetables. Uh, the format, most people uh, choose between one of these three. So either you can plant them in the garden bed, um, create beds for vegetables, incorporate them in existing garden beds. You can add containers to the landscape or onto hardscaping, or you can plant raised beds. So if you're, too, if you're gonna go with garden beds, um, you can kind of do something, you have to kind of decide what you want them to look like and how big they wanna be. We talked a little bit about the size, having to make sure that you can get into those garden beds. You can see in this picture here, it's uh, one way, if you have one large garden bed, you can just add some planks to make easy access between the rows. So there's lots of ways to go about it. Uh, one of the benefits of garden beds is that you have um, a lot of depth for those plants to grow in. There's going to be better moisture retention generally with in-ground plantings. Um, you're going to have um, an easier time kind of working the soil, amending the soil. I find it's, it's just easier to kind of dig in some compost rather than having to mix in a large, uh, in a raised bed. Uh, but saying that, you also have to deal with whatever the existing soil was. So there's pros and cons to both. Um, maybe a little harder to maintain in an urban urban space, especially if you don't have a lot of time and there's a lot of weed uh, seed uh, established in that existing soil. So those are some of the things that you have to think about, whether or not a garden bed is suitable. Does that person, does whoever's taking care of it want to get down and work at, at the soil level? Is that something that they're capable of? Uh, weed seed bank, um, but you're going to get much better water retention and the watering requirements will be less if you are able to install in-ground plantings of vegetables. And this is just another example of kind of a more fashionable in-ground planting. So you can still do a lot with um, just to say it, this is meant to kind of give you an idea for a front yard planting. So using black mulch, silver edging, uh, lots of height at the back, lots of different color block pl plantings. So just uh, a less traditional style, more formal, uh, kind of look nice in the front of a yard. So the other format that is really popular for growing vegetables in is containers. Um, containers the biggest uh, consideration when you're using containers is the size and what you're trying to grow. So if you're growing herbs, um, the size really isn't super important, like I said. Um, so whatever grows on the top of the, the plant is restricted by how much soil the roots have to grow. So if you're growing an herb, um, they don't need to grow a lot in one growing season, so you can have a fairly small container for their root system. But if you're growing something like tomatoes, you want you have to think about the final size of that tomato plant and make sure the roots have at least that much room in the container to grow to support that that foliage so it, generally they need to be fairly large i wouldn't plant a tomato plant in anything less than um kind of a 14 16 inch container uh, depth and diameter so you need to have enough space for those roots to get um, lots of nutrients, lots of compost, but they also need to have a really good um, base for water retention. Because that's the, the biggest problem with containers is daily watering is absolutely required, especially in the heat of the season, and making sure that the size of them is going to allow that plant to produce flowers and fruit. So style is something else um, that you can consider using containers here. You can see they're all matching on a patio, but really you can use anything. You can use all an eclectic mix of containers from milk crates to old um, 
plastic uh, growing trays, anything you have are suitable. But like I said, if you want fruit production, you have to make sure the size is suitable. Now this isn't an example of vegetables growing in containers, but I like, th like this example because um, all of these containers were different colors and uh, just to create a really nice display, we got a hold of them, spray painted them either orange or green uh, and really made a nice display out of a bunch of mismatched old containers. So you really can make a, a vegetable garden look really showy uh, using containers. And the other thing I like about these containers is they're gigantic. So you wouldn't have any trouble growing uh, tomatoes and getting fruit production or things like eggplant and peppers in containers the size like this. So I think uh, this done up as a vegetable garden would be a, a pretty spectacular container container garden. So finally, raised beds are probably the most popular way to grow vegetables these days because it kind of gives you the best of both worlds. You get that moisture retention that you would get if you had uh, a garden in the ground, but you also get the benefit of not having to bend down at the ground to, to take care of it. You can add your fresh soil so you don't necessarily need to amend it as frequently. You're not going to have that weed seed bank that you might have if you were growing them in the ground. There's a lot of discussion about what to build raised beds out of. And there are basically, there's a few options out there. Wood is the most common. Um, this one here you can see is made out of cedar. And that's typically the preferred wood that people use. And the reason for that is because it's untreated, but it's also the longest lasting. Uh, any untreated wood is is fine to use for, for a raised bed. Um, obviously, cedar is going to last a lot longer than pine would last. The other, um, people are, are using pressure treated wood these days to grow vegetables and it is safe. Um, it's safe according to regular standards, but organic growers are still saying that they're restricting vegetables from being grown in pressure treated wood. Um, pressure treated wood now it doesn't have arsenic in it, hasn't for a long time, I think 2003 or so. Um, they stopped using arsenic to make pressure treated wood. It's now made with a mix of copper and a fungicide. And the fungicides that are used are used on um, plants that people, uh, vegetables that people eat, or they're used in swimming pools, that type of thing. So they're not fungicides that aren't, uh, that are fairly safe. So if there is any leaching of either the copper or the fungicide into the vegetable bed, it's not a huge concern, but like I said, organic growers are still restricting them obviously because it's chemicals that are potentially in the, in the soil. So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of conversation about whether or not you should use pressure treated wood. Some people say it's totally fine. Some people are against it. Uh, if you wanna avoid the conversation altogether, cedar is a good alternative because it's long lasting, much like pressure treated wood would be. The problem is that it's more expensive. So it's a choice that that will be up to uh, the person who's eating the vegetables uh, and depends what your client needs. But those are the options for, for growing vegetables in, in raised beds. So you can do a very formal planting, uh, something like this, kind of a, a really nice looking raised bed, but you can also do it very inexpensively, um, kind of customized to whatever kind of space you're dealing with. It really is easy to put one together. Um, doesn't take a lot of effort, just some wood screws and some boards and some soil. Um, so that's uh, wood. Some people uh, are incorporating raised beds into their decks. So you, these are kind of custom made um, raised beds, planters that are built right into a deck. And you can see that they've been painted. Uh, and again, these were made out of um, pressure treated wood that was, was painted. Um, a lot of people like to use rocks, concrete, that type of thing is another common material for raised beds. A safe material to use obviously has a much different look and feel, a lot more permanent feel. Um, depends on, on the intention of the, the landscape. So I've seen, I've actually seen uh, some really nice ones made out of um, kind of stones, kind of like mason work. Um, I thought I had a picture of that uh, in the next slide, but uh, some mason work done to create some really nice raised beds out of stone. So you have to just think about the longevity of that raised bed, how long you want it to be there. Um, is it gonna be there for forever? Is kind of like five years a, a good time span? But if you plant a seed, if you build a cedar bed, that's probably gonna last close to 10 years. So that's kind of the life expectancy of, of that. 
Okay, so we talked about the format. So we can put them in beds, raised beds, containers. Uh, in all cases, we're going to need soil for those vegetables to grow in. Let's do a quick overview of soil. Um, the basic components of soil, the structural components is sand, silt, and clay. So that's what gives the, the plants um, a, the structure that can allow their roots to grow. So sand particles are uh, much larger than silt, which are much larger than clay. So if you think about having a clay soil, if it was all clay, you'd pour a cup of water on it, the water would just sit there. And that's because all the particles are super small, uh, all stuck together, the water can't permeate. Whereas sand, the particles are much larger and the water can permeate much easier. So ideally what you want is a mix of those three. That's uh, the most ideal uh, soil for root growth. Uh, the nutritional components of that soil can be uh, provided in one of two ways, either with chemical fertilizer or with organic matter. So when we're talking about uh, chemical fertilizers, um, generally you would purchase something and it would have an NPK value on it, which stands for nitrogen, um, phosphorus, potassium. And when you're talking about vegetable, so when you, are, nitrogen is good for vigorous leafy growth, um, when we're talking about uh, phosphorus, sorry, my apologies, uh, that's good for strong roots and flowers, fruits and seeds. And when you're talking about potassium, it's something that is good for overall plant growth. So when you're choosing a fertilizer for vegetables, they're usually labeled as such for vegetable production, and they have very low numbers. <clears throat> so something like, excuse me, <clears throat> 437, 464, those are the numbers that you'd usually be um, putting on a vegetable garden. So the formulations are very small. Um, you don't need, you kind of need a well-balanced fertilizer to grow vegetables. The, the first impression would be that you would need a high middle number because you want more flowers and fruits and seed production. But the truth is, is that you need everything to be healthy in the vegetable plant in order to, for it to produce those flowers and fruits. So you need good foliage, you need good roots, you need good overall plant health. So most vegetable fertilizers that are on the market have a very low, um, uh, nutrient level and it's consistent for all three of the key nutrients that plants need. Uh, my preferred way of providing nutrients to a vegetable garden is using organic matter, uh, something like adding compost, peat moss, animal manure, green manure, really doesn't matter what. Um, you, a lot of people have opinions on what type of animal manure is better, what type of compost is better. I, I don't have an opinion. I think any organic matter is better than not. You, the more the better. So if you can get your soil to have be 30% organic matter, you're going to have beautiful vegetables and not need to fertilize all, all season long. Um, some of the benefits of using uh, organic matter and amending the soil as opposed to chemical fertilizer is that you're going to get better nutrient retention in your soil because all the microbes that are living on that organic matter are working in the soil all the time to make nutrients available to those plants. The organic matter is what holds that water in your soil. So if you just had the structural components of soil and no organic matter, the water uh, doesn't have anywhere to be held onto. So watering is such a key thing with vegetables. Uh, it's very time consuming. The, that's what is the most important uh, thing for ensuring that you get fruit at the end of the season is keeping up with that watering. So everything we can do to lessen that watering, like adding tons of organic matter to our soil uh, is, is very helpful. Improves air circulation uh, in the soil. So again, the microbes are working, they release oxygen as a byproduct of, of their uh, decomposition and the, that's helpful to the roots of our, of our plants, promote soil biodiversity with lots of worms and microorganisms uh, in there. Helps with erosion, so it can really be helpful if you had, um, for example, that uh, garden I showed you at Atlanta Botanical Garden that was planted on a slope. The more organic matter is going to help stabilize uh, a garden if you have that type of a, a landscape. And it's a long lasting nutrient bank. So uh, I think maintenance is probably one of the biggest concerns for clients with vegetables. Uh, it's not like a perennial garden. You really have to pay attention to it. Uh, so if you don't have to go out there and weekly fertilize with a chemical fertilizer or biweekly fertilize, it's it's less things for someone to do to take care of the garden. So just adding a bunch of good organic matter at the beginning of the season can go a long way uh, for care throughout the season. So once you have the the nutrients in your soil, um, if you're dealing with a raised bed, you can you have a lot more control in that as well as a container. You can just kind of 
get the perfect soil mix and add it in and not have to worry about any of these uh, things here. But if you're dealing with an existing garden bed and you're really not sure uh, if the soil is suitable for growing vegetables, you might have to do a bit of research into the type of soil, the, what pH of that soil and the salinity of that soil. So when you're growing vegetables, you really want uh, a soil that is in the middle of this soil triangle. So clay loam, medium loam, um, the closer to the center your soil type is, the happier your vegetables are gonna be. When we're growing vegetables, we want them to grow really quickly in a short amount of time. And the, the nicer soil you have, the more easier it's gonna be for those roots to penetrate that soil. And the quicker they're gonna be able to, the, the faster you're gonna get uh, fruit production. So it's really easy to figure out your soil type. Basically just grab that empty mason jar, get a couple scoops of soil from a different, few different spots in the, in the yard, shake it up, let it set for overnight, settle for over a night or two. And what you'll see is it'll separate into three layers and that'll be your, your clay, your sand and your silt. So you'll be able to see a layer for each of the, the particles. Obviously the um, smaller particles are gonna be on the top, the clay and the sand will, will sink to the bottom. Figure out percentages, so get the total measurement for all three layers and then figure out the percentage of clay, percentage of sand, percentage of silt, and you can use a soil triangle such as this one to figure out your um, soil type. So you can kind of see on this diagram that for the clay percentage, the lines are a little slanted. So you would draw a line, say your, your soil was 40% clay, using that same angle of that line right through the triangle. Do the same for sand and then silt, you can see you draw a line that goes straight across. So where those three lines intersect, that's the type of soil that you have. So like I said, you want something in the center of the soil triangle for growing vegetables for the fastest um, growth rate. Now hand in hand with um, Having a good soil type is the pH of your soil. And this is generally not something you have to worry about, um, but perhaps you have a landscape where there's a lot of evergreens around. Um, in Ontario, I know we're dealing with mostly alkaline soils uh, with a lot of limestone in my area. Um, so usually it isn't a huge consideration. The pH is usually in somewhere around neutral, if not slightly alkaline, uh, but if you do, suspect you have a pH issue, perhaps there's something else going on. Maybe there's something environmental that you think is impacting the pH of the soil. You might wanna do a quick pH test. Ideal for growing any plants, most plants, except for kind of ericaceous plants, you wanna have um, a pH in the neutral range. So anywhere from 6.5 to 7.5. And the reason for that is because that's where all of the nutrients in the soil are most available to plants. So you can see here that uh, we talked about nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus being the most important um, macronutrients for plants. And those are most readily available in the soil within that neutral pH. You can see as the soil gets more acidic, the nitrogen and the potassium are not available at all. Potassium is, is more available on the alkaline spectrum, but all the nutrients plants need in the neutral zone are all um, most readily available. So you can see just kind of a, a note about copper. Copper is a, a nutrient that plants use. So that's why one of the reasons that pressure treated wood is considered safe is because copper is something that the plants, that plants use anyway. So if copper leaches into the soil, it isn't a huge issue um, for, for us to, to ingest. So that's why pH is important. Uh, nutrients have to be available to your plants and they're available at a neutral pH. So determining these things is fairly easy. So if you are concerned at all about the pH of your soil, it's a really easy test. Mix some soil up with some water. Um, like I said, it's good to get uh, soil from a couple different locations because maybe you have maybe you have an animal peeing in the same spot for 10 years and that's really causing a, a pH problem in a corner of the yard. So you might wanna try more than one spot just to make sure that you're getting a, a, an overall picture of the pH of the garden. But you can get an, a really easy soil kit like this at most garden centers. Uh, and you can just use these tablets mixed with your soil slurry and you can uh, determine your pH, um, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and potassium levels very, very quickly and easily. So the last uh, consideration is the salinity of your soil. Um, 
So this can be important if we're designing vegetable gardens in front yards where there's a lot of uh, road salt that might be impacting the soil. Uh, you might want to, I, I, I honestly wouldn't um, do a salinity test unless I had cause for concern because in most cases, um, outdoors, the rain is responsible for washing away any salts that build up in the soil. And we don't generally have to worry about it unless there's a constant a source of salt that's causing the, the high salt content in that soil. But salts are bad for, for our plants because they bind up water and nutrients. So the plants just basically don't can't get anything. They're growing in the soil and everything's bound up to the salts and they can't get anything. So it's a big problem with indoor plants. When you're fertilizing constantly, the byproduct of that fertilizer is salt. Uh, another reason why I'm not a huge fan of, of chemical fertilization, because it does create that salt built up. But like I said, outdoors, it's less of a problem because the salts can be washed away by the rain. Indoors, that's not the case. Uh, so it is important if you're doing a container garden. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me for their container vegetables, should they dump the soil every year? And the answer is, if you're using chemical fertilizer, probably, because it can have significant salt buildup in a single season uh, if you're using a, a fairly small container and heavily fertilizing. Uh, if you're using organic matter, probably not uh, necessary. There's still gonna be lots of organic matter. Just add a couple new scoops of compost and you should be good to go. So high salt is, is not something that is easy for us to test at home. Uh, the way that you would test the salt content of a soil is uh, it's electrical conductivity. So I know that's not something I have in my home toolkit. I'm not sure if any of you guys do, but usually you have to send it somewhere to get tested. Uh, if you find a uh, higher electrical conductivity, that means that there's a lot more salt in the soil. And there's a conversion factor for that based on the different type of soil that you have. So it's a bit more complicated. A uh, home test isn't gonna do it. Um, this is something that uh, I've recommended to people in the past. Um, so I get a lot of questions uh, about what if there's heavy metals in my soil? What if there's pesticides in my soil? I don't know if I want to grow food in them. Uh, and then other questions just about the fertility of the soil. Uh, do I have enough organic matter? What's the pH? What's the salt content? Now, like I said, in most cases, I don't really think any of these things are going to be a problem. In most of our landscapes, everything is at acceptable levels, unless there's a source that you know is potentially causing a problem, it's probably going to be fine. But if you have someone who really wants to know the answer to these questions, or you're really having a hard time growing something somewhere, you can always reach out to the University of Guelph and get some professional soil testing done. Uh, it's fairly inexpensive. You can see here, this is just a screenshot of their website. So um, less than $50 and you get pH, a uh, bunch of nutrient levels, how much organic matters in that soil and the total salt content of that soil. So if you're having a problem, uh, really want a soil test done, this is a inexpensive way to, to get that done. So companion planting, uh, another consideration when you're growing vegetables, something to think about. Uh, companion planting is kind of like an old wives tale. There's not necessarily a lot of science behind it, um, but a lot of people have found over time that growing certain plants to with other plants kind of helps boost the growth of both of them and often is good for pest management. So just a few examples here. There's tons and tons of examples. Um, basil helps tomato with insects and disease. Uh, broccoli does better when it's planted with rosemary and other aromatic herbs. Cabbage benefits from celery and planting a few radishes in a cucumber hill can help with cucumber beetles. So just a few examples. Um, if you're really interested in, in learning more about companion planting, uh, this book is an amazing resource, it goes through companion, lists every vegetable you can think of and uh, suggested companion plantings. And we'll give you the reason for it, which for sometimes is a very scientific reason. And sometimes is just uh, someone that has done this for years and swears that it works. So it's kind of one of those kind of loose sciences that uh, is very popular uh, with, and can be very helpful for pest management, especially in a, in a vegetable garden. Uh, crop rotation, another important consideration, especially if you're growing uh, large quantities in, in ground beds. Uh, the reason for that is if you grow the same thing in the same spot year after year, you're going to take the same nutrients from that spot year after year, uh, create a really nice uh, a spot for a, a particular pest that they'll know every year they'll have a, a food source. So it's a good idea to rotate between different families of plants that have different feeding abilities and different uh, pests. 
So this is just kind of an example of what you might rotate between, especially you have an in-ground um, vegetable garden. It's much harder to, to accomplish in a raised bed or in a container. And because you're amending such a small amount of soil regularly, it's less important. And it's also not very feasible if you have a, a raised bed uh, to necessarily rotate your crops. It depends on, on how many in the size. But in-ground beds, it's important to make sure you alternate heavy feeders with soil improvers and light feeders. So heavy feeders are really uh, most of the vegetables that we grow. Because we're getting such heavy fruit production, um, a lot of the vegetables we grow are very heavy feeders, take a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So if you're growing heavy feeders uh, year after year, you have to make sure you add a lot of organic matter. Uh, soil improvers are are things in the legume family. And the reason they improve the soil is because they're able to capture nitrogen from the air. Most plants can only retrieve nitrogen from the soil. Soil improvers can actually get it from the air. So they actually add that into the soil while they're growing. And light feeders are things like some of the root vegetables um, that don't have a lot of top, uh, top growth or fruit production. And we harvest at, at uh, for the roots at a younger age. So you can see there uh, things like beets, carrots, radish, so rotating um, within these three groups, especially if you have a large vegetable garden can be helpful to keep the pest population down and keep your soil healthy. So the last element we're gonna talk about here growing vegetables is maintenance. Um, I think this is kind of a hot topic for, I've talked to a few people who have been asked to install vegetable gardens and many people do understand the work that's required uh, but a lot of people just want to have the benefits and don't understand the, the requirements. Um, and some of these maintenance activities, we can take off people's hands by doing the planning, selecting the cultivars, um, maybe not doing seed, you're doing transplants, that type of thing. Um, we can take that off the client's plate. But things like uh, weeding, staking, harvesting, and watering, which I've omitted entirely from this slide uh, because it's uh, something that is just ongoing that has to be monitored, um, are, are something that has to be done on a weekly, if not daily basis throughout the growing season. So having a vegetable garden, you need to make sure that the weeding is done to keep the competition away from your vegetables to ensure they're gonna have good fruit production. And that can be really heavy uh, in April, May, but it does need to be done all season long. Staking is important, uh, especially with things like tomatoes. Uh, you need to make sure that as they're growing, they're getting support. Um, and watering, there's no way around it. Uh, we talked a little bit about it already, but um, in-ground beds, you can probably get away with every other day in the early season, but in the heat of the summer, you really need to water every single day. And the, for the best results, you need to water at the same time every day. It's, I mean, I've done, I've had good years and bad years with that myself. And I know that you can still be successful without watering at the same time every single day and skipping a day here and there. But the best advice is, um, if you're gonna avoid certain um, issues in the garden, things like blossom end rot are a result of inconsistent watering. Because when you water, you're changing the nutrient availability to your, your vegetables. So something like blossom end rot is caused by calcium availability in the soil. So by watering consistently, you're ensuring that the same nutrient availability is available to your plants all the time. So that's the reason for recommending watering at the same time of day. Um, a lot of you, it's recommended that you water also early in the day. And the reason for that is because if you have a lot of moisture overnight, you can be encouraging things like slugs and uh, fun, uh, molds and fungal growth on your plants. So there is reasons that people recommend watering consistently in the morning and every day, especially through the heat of the summer. But it's kind of a, a give and take thing. So the reasons for it are pest management and nutrient availability. And we cannot we can sacrifice that a little bit for some some life, <laughs> some uh, flexibility in our lives. Uh, but those are the reasons, and it's just an important consideration. If if a client doesn't have time to water or doesn't have someone to water for them, then vegetables are going to be a really hard hard one for people. Uh, so this is kind of a maintenance schedule that um, people just have to be aware of when they're they're planning to grow vegetables. So those are kind of the basics for for keeping plants head, your vegetable plants healthy. We're going to kind of finish off this lecture, this webinar today with plant selection.
and go over a few of these things that are important to consider. Do I plant transplants or seeds? Uh, how do I deal with the seasonality of vegetable gardens and the harvesting that has to go on? And which cultivars do I choose? So transplants or seeds, uh, I honestly think if you're uh, planting a vegetable garden for someone else, you should strictly go with transplants. And the reason I say that is because it's going to look nicer sooner. And that's usually what people are looking for. Um, I've included a chart here that kind of shows you what time of year you could sow uh, different seeds in the garden um, and what time of year you should plant transplants in the garden. It's a really excellent resource that I have a link for you guys to look at a little closer um, on your own time after the, the lecture. But my, my advice, if you're planting a vegetable garden for someone else, um, it's best to go with transplants just because they're gonna, they, there's not necessarily gonna establish faster because usually se planting seeds in the garden, they will catch up and look just as good as a transplant uh, in a few weeks time, but they're gonna look nicer sooner. You don't kind of have that transition stage where it looks like nothing's in the garden. Seasonality uh, is really important because vegetables, we plant May long weekend and we harvest at the end of uh, around Thanksgiving. That's kind of the season for vegetable gardens. Things are going to look different uh, throughout the season. So one way to combat that is to do multiple sowings. So successively sowing the same species multiple times throughout the year, two or three weeks apart. And that way you always have something going on. They might be in different stages, but you're not going to have a blank space in that in that spot in the vegetable garden. So these are some of the things that you can successfully uh, sow throughout the season multiple times. Things like carrots, uh, Swiss chard, um, kale. So a lot of the leafy vegetables and the small root vegetables that can be harvested young um, or mature, those are the types of things that you can plant multiple uh, times throughout the season. But again, you have to balance that with how much time someone has and whether or not seeding is something they want to get involved in or someone can can do for them. Another consideration about seasonality is cool and warm season vegetables. So generally, if you're wanting to sow seeds out in the garden, you need to make sure you're not doing it too early. And you can plant cool season vegetables before May long weekend because they need cold temperatures to germinate and they do a little better with a bit of frost. They kind of taste better. So things like carrots, Swiss chard, kale, peas, radishes, spinach, and lettuce are cool season vegetables. So if you do want to do seeds uh, out in the garden and not stick with transplants, I would suggest seeding only your cool season vegetables. And the reason for that is you could do it now before maybe people are spending as much time outside. So you would have less of a kind of gap with things looking good. By the time people are out there on May long weekend, some of these seeds would be starting to germinate. So it, knowing whether you have a cool season or a warm season vegetable is important. Things like um, warm season vegetables require uh, higher soil temperatures. So if you planted beans too early, then the chances are your seeds are going to go dormant again and they're not going to germinate. Um, I, I do often plant beans and cucumbers from seed out in the garden, but you have to make sure you wait till the May long weekend. Things like peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, and squash, they don't like cool nights at all and they definitely need to be started indoors. And that's because the number of days it takes for them to become from a seed to an eggplant, they need our entire growing season and some. So we need in Canada to get them, give them a few weeks uh, starting time indoors. So those ones are definite transplant um, uh, candidates. But if you do want to do seeding, seeding in the garden, stick with cool season vegetables. So it's uh, important to think about what the garden is going to look like throughout the whole season. Um, and these are some of the good ones that kind of look good all year. So they may look a little different. Um, going from small to large to different uh, amount of fruit on them. But these are some of the choices that if you have a spot that you need to look good um, and you can't kind of have it peter out in, in July, like something like um, lettuce might, you would want to go with some of these long season vegetables. Uh, these are the opposite of that. So these are not uh, long season vegetables. These are things that are prone to bolting and Bolting just means flowering, which all plants have an uh, innate uh, desire to do, to reproduce. Uh, things like coriander, lettuce, arugula, spinach, 
Um, we want to harvest the leaves. Once they go to flower, they don't do they don't produce leaf leaves anymore. So you they're pretty much useless to us as a, a vegetable. So you have to kind of um, balance where you grow these. They're going to look really, really good, really lush in the spring. They're going to probably flower in June. You're going to have to pull them out and either reseed or take a break and replant them in the fall. So it's just something to consider when you're um, looking at some of these leafy vegetables and some of these herbs. You have to have a, a plan. You either have to sow them successfully throughout the season, take them out and put a really fancy container there once they're done, um, they're, like once they start flowering, or you need to um, have a plan to kind of replant them in the fall. So an important consideration uh, for those guys. So you also have to think about harvesting. So if um, maybe someone wants a lot of lettuce in their garden, but they want to harvest it continually, you have to kind of have a plan for that. So um, how are you going to replace that planting once it's harvested? Are you going to do successive sowing? Are you going to have multiple rows that can kind of allow for regular harvesting? Do, do you want to have harvest something to harvest all season long? You want to make sure you have a mix of early season, mid season and late season uh, vegetables so that there's always something going on that someone can harvest from the garden. So maybe you want to plant some lettuce, some um, beans and some tomatoes just to make sure that there's something to harvest all year long. Uh, and also just thinking about what the garden's going to look like once people harvest. So something like tomatoes, uh, very little impact on the aesthetic of the garden. But if you're going to go out and harvest a whole um, head of lettuce, then that might leave a gap in the garden. So harvesting is something that you have to consider when you're when you're choosing which vegetables to grow. Some things are really uh, easy. You can do kind of staged harvesting throughout the season with Brussels sprouts, leeks, onions, kind of interplant, uh, kind of pick every other one sort of thing, and it'll have minimal impact on the, the look and feel of the garden. Same thing with herbs um, and kale. So these types of vegetables are really good choices if you want it to look good all year long, but also have the ability for people to harvest throughout the season. So cultivar selection is really important. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting something that has a really high yield, um, but also looks good and is going to be pest resistant. So there's kind of two schools of thought when you're choosing cultivars. Um, modern varieties are mostly bred for farming applications. So they're, they're grown to be very good in an environment where they're harvested mechanically, mechanically fertilized with chemicals. Um, they might be bred to withstand some sort of chemical treatment or for shipping. Whereas a lot of the heirloom varieties um, that you can get from some of the local seed houses have much more variety um, and opal, open pollinated, so you can collect seed from them in a lot of cases, a lot of better taste flavor, and a lot of different colors. So when we're designing vegetable gardens to look good in our urban landscapes, there's just a lot more options out there. You can get really unusual um, cultivars that are maybe appealing to people. So it's important to when you're reading a description for cultivar selection that you're getting what you want. So there's lots of things to consider. When is that vegetable going to mature? So for tomatoes you might get an early vegetable or a late mid uh, mid harvest vegetable or a late uh, season tomato. So you can either choose one of those or you can plant all three so that you have a really long season of tomato harvesting in your in your garden. So you have to look at when they mature. You have to look at disease resistance. So there's certain zucchinis that are much more resistant to powdery mildew and the cultivar description will tell you that. Uh, there's award designations that are awarded to cultivars and that means someone's kind of done the work for you and decided which cultivar is best and um, given it an award so that you know that that one is is going to be vigorous. Uh, and then looking for recommended growing conditions. So for example here, uh, the patio baby eggplant is an eggplant that has been bred to grow in containers. So if you're planting a container garden, you want to make sure that you do this. And that's because they have smaller fruit, so they're going to need less um, area for their roots to grow. So that means they're much more suited to growing in a, in a container. So you can have a lot more success if you choose a cultivar that's suited to the application that you're you're growing in. Um, if you look at the fairy tale eggplant uh, example there, 
I always like to recommend cultivars like this to people, like a, a smaller pepper, not like the big bells that we get that are greenhouse grown, um, but growing like a mini bell pepper or a mini eggplant, you're going to have a lot more success because it takes, first of all, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. So if you get 10 small eggplants versus one large eggplant, it's, it's kind of more, it's just more uh, fulfilling to go out in your garden and pick a couple little eggplants and not have to wait for one to mature. And the same thing with peppers. Sometimes you wait all season for that one big pepper to turn red. And by the time it turns red, red a worm got into it. So having mini um, bell peppers is much easier, much more fulfilling. You can go out and pick a, a few throughout the season. So I like to recommend that to people when they're choosing cultivars. And then this example here is you can see it was a 2014 All-American Selections winner. So uh, again, something that's an award winner uh, is going to be vigorous and kind of a proven cultivar that you don't have to guess whether it's going to be successful in the garden. And again, this one is suited to container growing. So reading the cultivar description is really, really important. So we're going to end the morning, um, afternoon. I've lost track of all time uh, and space here at home for seven weeks, but we're going to finish off uh, this afternoon with a few tips for success. Uh, so know how much time your clients have for maintenance, number one. Uh, vegetable garden needs to be tended, and obviously uh, I'm sure some of you offer maintenance plans to go along with it, but it is absolutely essential for growing vegetables. Make sure the scale is appropriate. I get carried away, uh, whether it's perennials or vegetables, I always buy more plants than I have space for. And especially with vegetables, when you're thinking about all the things you can do and eat with them, it's easy to get carried away. So keep uh, the palette simple, especially for first timers. Uh, choose the right format. So make sure that if uh, they can actually get into the space, make sure that it's easy for them. Do they need a raised bed in order to be able to do the maintenance, that type of thing. So make sure that the format fits the, the person that's going to be taking care of it. Uh, if you want it to look good, make sure you use transplants. Um, it'll get you that early impact that is kind of lacking in most vegetable gardens. Be picky about which vegetables you grow. So make sure you choose cultivars that are suited to the application and that are, are tried and true. Um, and just uh, a few uh, things for inspiration. Use herbs. If you're going for aesthetics, um, herbs are going to look like this from May 2-4 until Thanksgiving. So you don't have, if you, maybe you have a whole bunch of vegetables uh, interplanted with herbs that are going to kind of come and go throughout the season. Herbs are going to give you that long lasting interest throughout the season and they're going to uh, require less water. Really, really good choice for interplanting in the, in the vegetable garden. Get creative with your structures. So doing something like this with beans uh, can be a lot more interesting than just planting them on a regular trellis or growing them along a fence. That's uh, really important to kind of get creative with vegetables rather than just planting them in the ground so that they look uh, spectacular. Use leafy greens. Much like herbs, they're, they're going to give you that long season interest. Um, and you can get, even though they're all green, you can get a lot of contrast in the foliage, as you can see here, a lot of gray. The gray with uh, kale with the um, bright green parsley really does, it is quite showy, even though it's all kind of in the same uh, palette. But again, long season interest. Sometimes you have to grow something you might not eat. So this is an example of some containers with ornamental peppers. Ornamental peppers are edible, just like any other pepper, pepper same species. Most of them are super spicy. <laughs> so you, maybe you don't want to have 100 million uh, spicy peppers, but you have to kind of uh, sacrifice that if you want to have a gorgeous vegetable garden uh, throughout the entire season. Interplant when necessary. So sometimes you have to put some annuals and perennials if you want to have that uh, vegetable garden looking uh, tip top all season long. So this is kind of an example of uh, someone using a nice rudbeckia with some annual carex with a, a lot of chard. You could have chard all, all year in this, this vegetable garden and still have a spectacular looking space. Grow something unusual. That's kind of my motto for everything. It's just nice to have something different in your garden, something to talk about. Uh, uh, chickpeas are, are kind of fun to grow. It's kind of a gamble whether or not you're going to get chickpeas by the end of the season because the pods need a long time 
from seed to, to drying on the plant in order to get that dry chickpea out of the pod. Uh, but it's just fun to have something different, unusual to grow. I always think that's important in any garden, just kind of have a talking point. So that's that's the end of today's webinar. That's what I had planned uh, for you guys. Uh, I do have kind of a list of resources where I've included um, those growing charts, uh, where when to plant which type of vegetable and whether to use seed or transplants. I have the, a link for that for you guys. I have a list of some of my favorite places to buy seeds and transplants that I'd like to share with you guys. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to actually do that, um, <laughs> buy things uh, this growing season. Um, and I've also included a link to the All American Selections uh, award-winning vegetables just for your guys' um, interest. So I'd, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions we, we have here, Carrie. It looks like we have a few. Perfect. Yeah, we have a few. And actually, while we were on this call, uh, it has just been announced that the garden centers will actually be open this week. Excellent. So, That's yeah, so I uh, figured I would share that while, <laughs> while we're finishing up here. Excellent. Um, so we did have a couple of questions. Okay. So Lana asked, any suggestions on where to buy cardons or artichoke plants in the Toronto area? Uh, cardoons and artichokes. I have never seen them as transplants. Okay. I don't, I'm sorry that I don't have an answer for that one. Um, okay. I I know that William Dam I've, is starting to grow transplants and they, they've done it for a couple of years now and they've always had some more interesting things. So that would be somewhere where I might call. Um, but I I can't say that I've seen them. I've only seen them in seed form. Okay. As of Perfect. Um, and when do you start watering right after planting the seeds or when would you suggest starting? Yeah, definitely right after you plant just to make sure there's good, well, you want to keep, make sure they're moist, but it's also important sometimes like some air pockets get mixed in when you're doing the planting. So the mm -hmm. water is going to help with that, getting good contact with your seed with the soil. So watering right after seeding is important. It's, you got to do kind of a light watering so you don't wash away the seeds. <laughs> I've done that before and they've kind of run down with the water and then uh, they obviously can't germinate. So, but then you kind of want to monitor. You don't, if you're getting a lot of rain in the early spring, you don't want to overdo it because seeds can easily rot. So you just have to kind of keep an even moisture, make sure there's no water sitting on the soil. I definitely think every day is overkill in April and early May, unless we're having an exceptionally warm uh, season. Um, but you just have to monitor. You need to keep an, I would look at them every day and probably water every few days. After Perfect. Um, how much space do you need to grow pumpkins? A lot of space. <laughs> <laughs> So um, let me see if I can come up with a number here. So I would say four by four feet for one pump pumpkin plant at a minimum. And you really can even um, plant them in, in larger spaces if you have it, because the vine will grow on forever, but you kind of need a good four by four space to grow a single pumpkin plant. Right. Um, and then Lissa says, you have chickpeas listed as having good, uh, having good seasonality. Have you successfully grown chickpeas before in our climate? Yes, I have. But I, as I mentioned in that um, uh, last slide there, they, they need, I think a typical vegetable needs about 60 days to from seed to fruit, whereas mm -hmm. chickpeas are on the high end of that spectrum, so like 75. Um, so you need a good long season for them to grow. And when you're growing any dried bean, you want enough time for that pod to stay on the plant and dry on the plant, and then you mm -hmm. harvest them dry. So you harvest the chickpeas dried on the plant. So you're probably looking at a very late fall harvest, but I have grown them successfully in, in Ontario. Okay, perfect. But you don't get a lot. I, if, if you saw in the picture, chickpeas are a single chickpea per pod. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But it's really for the plant enthusiast rather than getting a lot of chickpeas for your winter sustenance. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, tropical ba basil cultivators, uh, cultivars, sorry, where can I get them? Where can you get basil cultivars? I honestly seen a pretty good selection um, at William Dam. There's a lot of, there's seed, you can get seed anywhere. So, um, you can get really good seed. I've seen at uh, Ball Superior, which is in my list of suppliers. 
Um, I've even seen at like my local garden center, uh, like Loblaws Garden Center, I've seen really good selection of basil cultivars. They have um, their line of, um, what are they called? The name has escaped me, but the, the line Loblaws is, is making now is kind of like the premium cultivars. I've seen the variegated basil uh, grown by them before. So they're, they're readily available. If you go to a Loblaws store, uh, their brand is got some cool basils. Uh, William Dam definitely had some different cultivars last year as well. And they're doing, they have their greenhouse. Um, gr they used to only sell seed. Uh, and a couple years ago, they built a greenhouse and started selling some of their cultivars in their greenhouse. So it's another good source. Perfect. Um, and do you feel uh, feel front gardens in busy center er city areas are at higher risk for more concerning levels of pollutants? I really don't think so. I mean, we all live in such a dense urban space. I think the pollutants are front yard, backyard, uh, kind of the same levels. And the way I always like to think of it is where are our vegetables being grown? We don't even necessarily know. Some of them come from other countries where we don't even know what the conditions are like. So I'm of the opinion that uh, my front yard, at least I know what's going on. I mean, if you have a big uh, spill of, of something in your yard, that's another issue. But I just think regular air pollution in, in the city, it is what it is. And um, I think it's my, I'm of the opinion it's better to know than not kind of thing. Perfect. All right, and that looks to be all of the questions here. So on okay. behalf of Landscape Ontario, we wanna thank you, Jody, for joining us today. And thank you to everybody who has was able to join the seminar. A reminder that we will send out the replay shortly after the seminar is finished, along with the PowerPoint and the links to the resources that Jody has uh, spoken about. Uh, to learn more about some of our upcoming online seminars and webinars, please visit portraits.com. And thank you all so much, and we will see you all soon. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Jody. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.